I want to thank, first of all, everyone, because I have, I am feeling very welcome here. I've traveled many places over many years, and I've never felt more welcome than I do in Brazil at this moment in this place. So thank you. I'm always trying to uh, challenge assumptions and to see what might be if you think it in a different way. And that's been, of course, I've been, I've been rewarded professionally for this, let's put it that way. You've invited me here, I go places, because I don't seem to think the way everybody else thinks. begin at the beginning. Always assume your ignorance. Uh, don't rely on secondary sources except to confirm or sometimes elaborate on what you have, but don't take secondary sources as primary. I would like to have the opportunity to use my life as the basis for a novel, and I would like to have the opportunity to recognize that everybody's autobiography is uh, full of lies. So I would like to have the opportunity, first of all, to let my reader know that this autobiography is no different than any other autobiography. It is to some degree self-serving. Uh, it is to some degree as honest as it can be, but it's, uh, you know, you can't be totally honest. I'd love to be able to do in an autobiography what I can do in art and in science, that is to let my mind go free. Innovation and excellence are an inverse relationship to each other. That is, when innovation is high, when new things are happening, excellence is low. To be new is to fail, to really fail, to not be able to do it well. And when excellence is high, innovation is low. Because you need to have mastered the shape. This, I think, is true also in the realm of ideas, not only in the realm of arts, in the realm of ideas. And of course, as we get to a more market-oriented, neoliberal uh, society, people are less interested in real innovation. They're interested in honing, getting the edge, rather than taking the chance. So uh, it's, uh, uh, okay. In science and engineering, the failures rarely reach the market, but in the arts, in performance, because it is an art that needs an audience, and an art whose works cannot be tucked away, awaiting more receptive times as novels and paintings can, failures are enacted publicly. But over time, as experimental processes are honed and new forms, new venues, and new styles are tested, improved and accepted, success replaces failure. Today's uh, excellence is also a paucity of originality. Every brilliant use of media or mixed media, each unorthodox use of space or site-specific work, like we saw yesterday, every attempt to involve the audience, again, we saw yesterday, each knitting together of the performers' real lives and fiction. Every you name it has been done before, but maybe not as well. More bad or unacceptable performances would signal an avant-garde actually in advance of. Avant-garde artists prided themselves on originality, on innovation, and the rejection if not outright destruction of the past. The avant-garde was populated with ideas and actions clustering around words in English with counterparts in other languages as new, revolutionary, alive, aggressive, anti, and so on, with a clear intent, rhetorical if not actual, to destroy both the existing aesthetic and socio-political order. Indeed, in the aesthetic sphere, the newest new opposed and swallowed the new that came before, from futurism and cubism and constructivism through to surrealism and Dada, on to abstract expressionism, conceptual art, environmental theater, pop art, and the abolition of hierarchies. The avant-garde divided roughly into what Alan Caprow called art-like art and life-like art. The dynamic tension Caprow theorized provided the energy 
for the avant-garde burst of the 60s and 70s. This activity raised very deep questions, which again were brought up last night, I think. What is performance? Where does it take place? Can anyone perform? Can a performance event, no longer a play or a concert, no longer theater, dance, or music as such, but an event, a piece, a work, proceed in a non-linear way? And if so, what gives it unity? Does it need unity? What is the relationship or relationships among the performing arts, popular culture, politics, rituals, therapies, sports, and play? And the performances of everyday life, of business, of law, and of medicine. By the second decade of the 21st century, where we are now, these questions seem settled. Of course, performance can take place anywhere and can include anything. What's next is no longer a relevant question because anything can happen, will happen, and can be absorbed. That's part of this corporate thing. The corporation, the concept of the corporation is very, very flexible. It can absorb and use for its own uh, 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 advance. It's a very uh, uh, stable system. It's not a system that is likely to uh, go away because it takes radical change and de-radicalizes it by accepting it, taking what's useful to its own, and kind of easing out uh, the rest. Theory's role in the formation of the conservative avant-garde is demonstrable. Restored behavior, surrogation, ghosting, haunting, citation, these are all words used by theorists. Uh, restore, restored behavior is my word, surrogation is Joseph Rauch's word, go, ghosting is uh, 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 there's a moment. Uh, citation is Derrida's word. Marvin Carlson. Ghosting and haunting are Marvin Carlson's words, and citation is Derrida's words, uh, uh, as is the deferral of meaning. All of these indicate the impossibility of defining, no less finding, originals. In the late 1960s, I began the thinking that led to various versions of restoration of behavior, which achieved its definitive shape in 1985 in the book Between Theater and Anthropology, which John referred to. Although I didn't know it then, I see now that I was undermining the ruling ideas of the historical avant-garde as expressed in my own theater works. In other words, my theory was saying, restoration was saying, there's nothing possible new. And I was doing work at exactly the same time, which I was saying, gee, look at this new stuff. Restoration of behavior preceded and paralleled the thinking of feminist performance theorists such as Judith Butler, Peggy Fallon, Jill Dolan, and Sue Ellen Case, whose works took off in the late 1980s. The feminists often drew on the earlier thought of Foucault, Derrida, and Lacan, notions of iteration, citation, and historiography. A little later, in the archive and the repertoire, my colleague Diana Taylor, uh, who originated and runs the Hemispheric Institute of Performance and Politics, who's had their uh, annual meeting once in uh, Be 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 Bela Horizonte, and we'll have a meeting again in Brazil in January, has written a brilliant book called The Archive and the Repertoire with large, uh, she's a specialist in Latin American performance. She's actually Mexican, despite her name, Diana Taylor, and her first language is Spanish, and, uh, and her first second country is Canada. So don't be deceived by the word Diana Taylor. So here, her, her book, The Archive and the Repertoire, I'm glad it's coming into Portuguese. It's a very, very good book. Diana Taylor took up the problem of the unstable relationship between embodied practice and the archive. From the perspective of queer theory, do you, do you guys know what queer theory is? Yes? How many know queer theory? Just a few. Well, queer theory is, to some degree, about uh, homosexuality, but it really is much larger than that. It's theory that is based on a certain uh, gay view of the world, but, it's, uh, but the notion of queering is a kind of twisting to look at something from a, a, a non-mainstream uh, point of view. So there's a whole business of K, uh, queer theory about gender uh, bending, about identity uh, shaping, uh, about the location of plasticity, as it's technically known, of change, how deep into the human uh, psyche and uh, uh, organism a change can occur. From the perspective of queer theory, Jose Munoz explored similar themes in disidentifications and cruising utopia. 
All these scholars and many others in the same vein emphasize the performative construction of social identity. That's what's important. Performative construction of social identity and construction of gender, sexual orientation, and daily life roles and the tensions between embodiment and recordings and that word's various meanings. Some refer to the deadness of performance not as an inactivity, but as an uncanny presence as absence. Many artists in the making studied with these and like-minded scholars. In earlier epochs, emerging artists were trained by apprenticeship, not at school. Today, the Performance Studies Department at New York University, which I helped conceive in the late 60s and 70s, and which took its current name in 1980, is populated by artists taking a dip in the scholarly river. What began at NYU 35 years ago is increasingly the norm at many schools where young artists learn to post, learn the post theories undergirding the niche guard. Starving artists and waiting to be discovered have been replaced by applying for grants, landing a teaching gig, and being invited to festivals. I turn to anthropology not as to a problem-solving science, but because I sense a convergence of paradigms. Just as theater is anthropologizing itself, so anthropology is being theatricalized. This convergence is the historical occasion for all kinds of exchanges. The convergence of anthropology and theater is part of a larger intellectual movement where the understanding of human behavior is changing from quantifiable differences between cause and effect, past and present, form and content, etc., and the linear modes of analysis that explicate such a worldview to an emphasis on deconstruction, reconstruction of actualities, the processes of framing, editing, and rehearsing, unquote. <laughs> Anthropology began as a kind of the child of the missionaries and the uh, business interests, the, uh, the, the, the colonialists. They needed to know the people they were encountering in Asia, in the uh, Americas, in Africa, not to help them, but to better exploit them or to change them to become Christian. So the earliest really fine ethnographic observations were from missionaries. And this, well, the church very much understood that you had to understand the people before you could change them, and then you had to negotiate. Yes, indeed, let the Orishas of Condomble coexist with Mary and Jesus, because you cannot erase the Orishas, but you can, in a certain sense, Christianize the people, so, uh, uh, and have a kind of syncretic syncretism. So then anthropology liberated itself from this to some degree, but one is never entirely liberated from one's past, from one's roots. And so when we go with an NGO, when we go to help people, when we go to stop practices that we in this room probably agree are barbaric, female circumcision, enslavement, and so on, we are still faced with the same problem. For whom are such practices barbaric? And who sets universal human rights? And uh, etc. And although I myself want to set universal human rights, I want to not avoid the problem. And the problem gets worked out through performance. You know, the circumcision itself is a performance. Any surgical act is a performance. It's an intervention in the body to help it or harm it. From torture to a circumcision to surgery that saves your life. It's in the same uh, range of invading the body, uh, sometimes to save society. That's when you torture somebody for the help of the society you want to save, as it were, in quotation marks. And certainly European culture has uh, a great deep experience with torture before the current century. But also a surgery itself, you know, where we remove the cancer or we correct the defect. So we have to, my whole life has been devoted to saying, put together ideas that are not comfortable together and see how they dance. In 
1985, I published Points of Contact Between Anthropological and Theatrical Thought. That essay is actually in the new book. It was the first chapter of my pointedly titled Between Theater and Anthropology. Between theater and anthropology. Not theater, not anthropology, not theater anthropology, not anthropological theater. Liminal, between, not belonging entirely to either and not belonging not. Not yet two years after Victor Turner's death, I used the word between, a stand-in for liminal, to announce my intention of further extending Turner's ideas into the then almost brand new field of performance studies, whose first academic department had come into existence at New York University in 1980. And not only Turner, but a whole gamut of North American social scientists who were taking the performative turn, from Irving Goffman to Clifford Geertz, Richard Bauman to William Beeman, Barbara Meyerhoff to Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet, and many more. Performance promised a dynamic way of understanding how people relate to each other, both in everyday life and in a variety of special situations. Performance, as I summarized it then, and still do today, is a broad spectrum of activities ranging from ritual and play in all their perplexing and hard to define varieties to popular entertainments, celebrations, activities of everyday life, business, medicine, and the aesthetic genres of theater, dance, and music. A very broad range. I said, that everything and anything can be studied as performance. I also said what is performance depends upon the location, both in space and in time, and the cultural practice being considered. So everything can be studied as performance, but not everything is performance, even more perplexing some things is performance at one place in time and is not at another place in time. It was not that everything about all these activities, that long list I gave, is performative, but that they each had qualities that could be effectively analyzed and understood as performance. The reach of the theory was not limited. I argued that anything could be apprised and analyzed as performance, while what is performance, which I've just talked about, a much more limited domain, could only be determined within specific cultural contexts, located within specific points or ranges of time. In theater, an actor is not the character, but an actor is not not the character also. So it, it's not true, it really isn't true. When you're a director and you're talking to somebody and you're playing, uh, let's say, Henry V, I, uh, I may say, hey, Henry V, why don't you do it? No, I say, John, when you're in this scene, and you're saying the St. Crispin's Day speech, I'd like you to you know, say it with a little more enthusiasm. I don't say, hey, Henry, when you're saying the, uh, your talk, I mean, unless I'm a nuts director, I mean, I, I don't do it anyway. I call you John, you're John. I don't call you Henry. But I know that you're doing Henry. And when you get up there and speak, you're going to say, you know, those who've been there, you know, uh, saying Christmas Day speech about heroism, you'll remember this day and all. You're going to be speaking as Henry. But I also know that the spectator knows you're not Henry. Henry's back in the 15th century. Uh, you're here, et cetera, et cetera. They paid money to see John Dawsey play Henry V, et cetera, et cetera. So it became, it, uh, maybe it was a flash, maybe it was just a lamination. You're not Henry V, but you are not you are also Henry. The first thing was that you are not, but you are. But that didn't strike me as a powerful idea. So 
being contrary, being Richard in this. I thought not and not not because I, I like mathematics, you know. One times one equals one, but minus one times minus one also equals one. Minus two times minus two equals four. That's always amazed me. Minus two times plus two equals minus four. And plus two times plus two equals four, but minus two times minus two equals four. Now the logic of it is that uh, a minus cancels out its, itself. So you can eliminate the minus there and you get the positive. All right, that's, that's arithmetic or algebra. But I felt that that's conceptually true also, that these two negatives working against each other yield for the audience a positive experience, the experience of seeing Henry V. But it also gives to the actor the freedom to interpret Henry, to become Henry in many different ways. If the actor really is Henry, then they're chained in. And like Pirandello wrote a great uh, play about this called Henry V, I think, or Henry VI or something. Not the six characters in search, but the other one in which the actor really thought he was the character and how this was, uh, he was nuts. Uh, and and uh, we do have certain accounts in, in film history where actors get locked into characters like Bela Lugosi as, uh, as Dracula, you know. But it ruined his life. He complained that he could never get other roles because they only saw him as Dracula because he had this Hungarian accent and he couldn't get rid of it. So he he was Dracula in a positive imagina uh, people's imagination. But that was so limiting. So he wasn't so much not Dracula and not not Dracula, he was Dracula. Uh, and whenever people think, at least North Americans, think of Dracula, you think of, the, of, of these accents, you know, I never drink vine, you know, and, and, and the movies of, of this particular figure. Yeah, probably had no historic relationship to the real Count Dracula, but it was this actor. All right, so then the, so that the, the freedom that a double negative gives you of, of, of not making a final choice, that it's a profoundly processual formula to not and not not is a it means not for the first time, not, uh, you know, but only for the second time. It, it just is, it, it, the two most, the three most important parts of that theory are that the future creates the past. That's the idea that the, what I want to do uh, tomorrow determines what I reconstruct or restore from yesterday to play today. The future creates the, the past, that nothing is ever done for the first time, it's from the second to the nth time. And that everything that's done exists in the field between not and not not. Those are the three uh, 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 contributions of that essay. And it's a, the, it's a theory that is not simply, it's not, not simply about uh, performance in anthropology, but it's a really a theory of, of human behavior and of, 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 it's an epistemological theory of human knowledge an experiential theory, that we are doing this interview, but it's not for the first time. Or it is, this particular constellation of it is for the first time. But the language we use, the grammar we use, the equipment we use, the words we use, the ideas we begin to play with, all of them are restored behaviors, you see. And we're selecting what we're doing from my past and from your past, doing it today, in service of this future project, which will be this film or whatever you're going to make from it. So it's a, uh, everything is restored behavior in that regard. And then uh, the Netty story, which uh, uh, before I developed this theory, I had read while I was living in South India in 1976. I was reading uh, some of the Vedas. And this may be from a Veda or it may be from an Upanishad. Now it's not super important that we know the difference between the Veda, the four ancient uh, Rig Veda, Artha Veda, Sam Veda, and uh, one other Veda, the, the, the basic Hindu texts, um, Yajur Veda is the fourth one, and they have different range, ranges of knowledge. And then the Upanishads are also sacred texts, there are more of them, and they are more uh, narrative, and I think probably this is an Upanishad and not a uh, Veda of the student who goes to the teacher called a guru in India and he says, uh, Guru, 
Guruji, please tell me, uh, is the fundamental structure of the universe material? And the teacher says, neti, not that, not that. Now, they're not in the habit of answering, so he just said neti. So the student thinks for a while and says, well, is the essence of the world spiritual? And the teacher says, neti, neti. And then the students, well, is the, is the essence of the universe the idea of God? And uh, neti, neti. And it goes on through a whole list of possibilities of what is the essence and core of the universe. And every time he gets the answer, neti, neti, not that, not that. And finally, the student has the illumination that neti is the answer that the essence of the universe is not that, that the not that is what the universe is. This is so contemporary for Higgs bosons that were just uh, supposedly discovered, which is the core of what dark matter is, the not of the universe, the matter that we cannot directly uh, observe, but know only because of its effect, the, the negativity of that. Uh, and also, uh, I was very affected by uh, Keats's poem where he talks about negative capability. Keats, not a poem, maybe it's, a, maybe it's an essay, writes that Shakespeare is so great because he has a negative capability. And what did Keats mean? Keats said in this essay, Shakespeare has the ability to become anyone, therefore he's no one. If he was, had a personality, he could not be all these other personalities. So his capability is negative. It's a negative capacity. He has not capability. Keats says, Shakespeare has a negative capacity. Uh, it's so brilliant. So it's this, and, and it relates to my uh, attraction of Buddhist thought of emptiness, present centeredness, you know, start from the beginning, point zero, or, you know, all of these, these are scientific ideas. They're mystical ideas, of course. But they're mystical ideas that appeal to me because they reduce things to, to zero. And I've just done this piece called Imagining O, and then you know, I talk about zero. And what is zero? Zero is nothing, but it's the multiplier. You put, uh, uh, okay, so here, we'll do a little thing. We'll use the notebook. So zero, uh, let's do this. So zero is no, is nothing. Yeah. Okay. Now, what is that? That's ten. And what's that? That's a hundred. And what's that? That's a thousand. And what's that? That's ten thousand. Zero. So nothing, nothing, uh, when added to a one or any other number, is a multiplier. Is by a factor of so ten. It's a, it's so, but nothing becomes everything, and this whole thing. You should point this over here to this lovely computer. This 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 whole thing is a system of ones and zeros. That's all it has. Uh, ones and zeros, and how to how to arrange them and how to program them is everything that's in that chip. And if we develop more advanced chips, I'm sure that'll be uh, whatever else it'll have. It'll have zero. So that much I'll predict. Uh, and if we go to super mysticism, whatever else God must be, it must be zero. If God has anything beyond zero, then it's already been created. So, uh, so all of this, uh, so it's not just me, but there's a huge amount of mystical and I think very powerful thought around zero.